وكذلك أوحينا إليك روحا من أمرنا ما كنت تدري ما الكتاب ولا الإيمان ولكن جعلناه نورا ولكن جعلناه نورا نهدي به من نشاء من عبادنا وإنك لتهدي إلى صراط مستقيم صراط الله الذي له ما في السماوات وما في الأرض ألا إلى الله تصير الأمور بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن والاه السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته and welcome to another episode of Fundamentals of Faith In the last few episodes we've been discussing various manifestations of acts that go against one's profession of La ilaha illallah manifestations of shirk of directing acts of worship to other than Allah Today we're going to continue with that same theme and discuss one very important act which contradicts and is a stepping stone to shirk. And this act is the act of venerating and showing respect to graves and building mausoleums over them. Stay tuned. Today's topic is about building structures or mausoleums over graves and showing respect and veneration to such icons and proving that this is a stepping stone to shirk, which is a nullification of your testimony of La ilaha illallah. Now, there's a topic that is definitely very interesting that comes to mind, and that is, where did shirk start from? Because we know that, Ibrahim, that Adam alayhi salam, the father of all of mankind, was a prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he must have taught his children tawheed. He must have taught his children La ilaha illallah. Where did shirk come from? When we turn to the Mustadrak of Al-Hakim, and we look at one of the narrations here, Nuh alayhi salam was the first prophet to be sent to mankind. Ibn Abbas narrates that between Adam, who was the first prophet, and Nuh, excuse me, was the first messenger. And the difference between the prophet and the messenger will be discussed in a later show. But Adam alayhi salam was the father of mankind and the first prophet. Between him and Nuh were ten generations. Ibn Abbas narrates, between Adam and between Nuh were ten generations, all of them were upon Tawheed. All of them believed in La ilaha illallah, and then shirk came in. Well, where did it come in? For this, we go to another narration in Sahih al-Bukhari, volume 8. Ibn Abbas narrates that concerning the verse in Surah Nuh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is describing the people of Nuh, and the people of Nuh told their fellow people, that do not leave your gods. Do not leave Wad and Suwa and Yaghuth and Ya'uq and Nasr. Ibn Abbas says, these people were five people amongst the people of Nuh who were pious and practicing people. When they died, Shaytan inspired their nations to build idols and icons over their places of worship. Until eventually, those idols and icons became idols besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that were worshipped besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The point is that, how did shirk start? Where did it come from? Ibn Abbas narrates to us that, initially there were ten generations upon Tawheed. These ten generations all worshipped Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. Then, five people came, Wad and Suwa and Yaghuth and Ya'uq and Nasr. And these five are mentioned in Surah An-Nuh. These five people came and they were pious worshippers of Allah. They would pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they would fast, they would show the, their piety and asceticism to the people, such that the people were impressed with them. When they died, their graves were taken as places of worship. Icons and statues were built over them. In another narration, it is reported that when these people died, shaitan came to their community in the form of an old man. And he said, should I not build statues and structures of these people similar in shape and put them facing the direction of the Qibla, worship? They said, no, we cannot face an icon when we worship. So shaitan said, well, what if I place them at the back of the masjid? 
behind your backs. So look at the tricks of shaitan, just to get it in. So they said, well, okay, that's fine. Shaitan said, they will remind you of their worship of Allah, so you will worship them, you will worship Allah like they used to worship Allah. Look at the trick and the plot of shaitan. He didn't say worship them. He said, when you look at their picture, when you see their image, you will be reminded of the worship of Allah. When you see their image of that wed and suwa and yaghuth and a'u, you will remember how they used to pray, how they used to fast, how they used to remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and therefore you will do as they used to do. And he then tricked them to build these icons and place it in their masjid or their place of worship over their graves. That generation died. Another came, and then another, and then another, until the original story was forgotten. Where did these idols come from? Then shaitan came to them again, and he said, as a figure of an old man, and he said, do you know what these icons are for? They said, no, we just found our forefathers having them before us. So he said, verily, these icons were idols that your fathers and forefathers used to worship. So they started worshipping them. What is the point of narrating all of this? The point is to prove that the basis for shirk, the initial start of shirk, how did it start? Where did it come from? What is the history? It was when pious people and the graves of pious people were venerated. Respect was shown. The mausoleums were built over them. So the root of shirk was the over-exaltation of pious people. The Prophet ﷺ said in a hadith in Ibn Majah, he said, I caution you, I prohibit you from transgressing beyond the bounds, from exaggerating in your religion. Because the people before you, they were destroyed because of this exaggeration. They went more than they should have gone. They went higher than they should have gone. Yes, Isa ibn Maryam is a pious person. And Wad and Suwa and Yaghuth and Ya'uq also were good people. But that doesn't mean that they should be worshipped. And by going to their graves, if they have them, or knowing where they are and, and making it a point to go there, seeking blessings from those graves, making dua to them, building large monuments over them, this is a stepping stone or it is a manifestation of shirk. And that is why the Prophet wasallam he forbade worshipping in graveyards or even where there is a grave and a masjid has been built over it. The Prophet wasallam said, don't make don't make your houses like graveyards and say your prayers in them. In other words, don't just pray in the masjid, also pray in your houses. And he also said, and don't make my grave a regular place of worship. Don't make my grave a regular place of worship. Verily send your salams upon me because it will reach me wherever you are in the world. We'll take a short break and we'll continue on the same topic. As for the Medina, which is the city of the Prophet, I want to go there and see the masjid that the Prophet built. I also want to see the tomb. Imagine the daunting task of preparing 100 young Muslims to cross three continents. People living from where then? From Montreal. Together in prayer, like Muslims all over the world, the group faced towards the Kaaba, the holiest of Islamic sites. Islam is not a race, or a culture, or a country. Each member of the group has a different heritage. Imagine for each time you say subhanallah, that's one hasana. And as the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam stated in one hadith, al hasanatu bi ashri amthal. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in one hadith said, وَجُعِلَتْ قُرَّةُ عَيْنِ فِي الصَّلَاةِ That the peace of my 
eye and the comfort of my mind is being put in the position of salah. When the person is focusing heart and mind in his salah, and what Allah commanded him to recite and their meanings, Allah would forgive him his sins. And in another narration, illa wajabat lahu al-jannah. Welcome back. We were discussing building mausoleums and building monuments and structures over graves and venerating these graves. And that this is a major stepping stone. And in fact, sometimes there are manifestations of clear and blatant shirk. And it is because of this that the Prophet ﷺ himself, regarding his own grave, which he knew obviously that he, uh, he knew that it is possible that some people might exalt or put him above his status, therefore during his lifetime he prohibited it. He said, don't make my grave a regular place of visiting, a regular place of worship. And he said, send your salam upon me because it will reach me wherever you are. It is because of this that the early scholars of Islam, they understood this fact. In fact, uh, there is a good narration if you can find, if you can hand me uh, the book Fadl Salat Ala Nabi. Uh, this is a very small book written by Ismail ibn Ishaq al-Qadi who died in the year 282 Hijri. Now this, these type of books are called Juz or Ajza. And there are literally hundreds of them. These are not voluminous, huge works. Some of the scholars of the past, they would combine a hadith of a very narrow topic. And this author, he died in the year 282. He compiled some hadith about the blessings of sending the Salat and the Salam, the, the blessings upon sending, uh, the blessings upon the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam of the narrations that he has is that once there was a person by the, uh, there was one of the descendants of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam Muhammad ibn Ali ibn Abdullah ibn Ja'far ibn Abi Talib that when he came to Medina Ali ibn Hussein ibn Ali he is the great grandson of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam through his daughter Fatima he is the great grandson of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam through his daughter Fatima he saw him continually Ali, the great grandson, he saw this person continually visiting the grave. Every after every prayer, before every prayer, he would go to the grave of the Prophet. So he asked him, Why do you do this? So he replied, I love to send my salam, my blessings upon the Prophet. So Ali said, and this is the great grandson of the Prophet. He is not just any scholar, he is of the descendants of Fatima and Ali, the grandson of Fatima and Ali. He says, should I not narrate to you a hadith that I heard from my father, from his father, meaning the Prophet ﷺ? So he's giving you a very good chain of narrators. His father from his father, who are direct descendants of the Prophet ﷺ. He said, yes, why don't you narrate this to me? He said, I heard my father narrate from my grandfather that he heard the Prophet ﷺ say, don't make my grave a regular visiting place. لا تجعل قبري عيدا. Don't make my grave a regular visiting place and send your salam upon me wherever you are because it will reach me wherever you are in the world. In another narration he said to this man, he said whether you're standing here or you're standing in Spain. Now remember at that time Spain was the furthest part of the world that they knew. He said whether you're standing here in Medina or you're standing in Spain, it is the same. The Prophet ﷺ will hear your salam because as we know in our authentic hadith, the Prophet ﷺ said that Allah has assigned angels to hear the salams that my followers say and bring them to me. So the fact of the matter is that exalting the graves, even the graves of the prophets, even the grave of the best prophet, the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ, it is a stepping stone. It is a stepping stone to prohibited acts. And that is why even other narrations there is another great grandson, great great grandson of the Prophet ﷺ. He also, when he saw people congregating, he said the exact same thing. He said, "Don't take." He said that the Prophet ﷺ said, "Don't take my grave as a regular visiting place." It is also because of this, the fact that building ma mausoleums and building structures over graves is a stepping stone to shirk. It is because of this that the Prophet ﷺ forbade this act. That is why. When a grave is dug, 
and then the body put and covered, it is prohibited, haram, to put a large structure over it, or put bricks around it, or even to write anything on it. It should be an unmarked grave. The Prophet ﷺ clearly prohibited this. If you can have me, Akhi Sunan and Nisa'i, volume 3, we'll look this up ourselves and read it directly from the books. What did the Prophet ﷺ have to say about building on graves and writing on them? And we, Sunan and Nisa'i, uh, as we know, is written by the famous scholar Imam al Nisa'i who passed away in 279 Hijri and he had traveled far and wide. And actually, an interesting uh, thing about him was that. He was from a very rich family. And when his father passed away, he left a lot of money for him. So throughout his life, he never had to worry about money. But look at him, subhanAllah. When many of us in our times, when we have this, we misuse and abuse the money. As for him, when he realized that Allah had blessed him with money, therefore he diverted himself to studying knowledge. And he didn't misuse and abuse the money like many of us unfortunately do. No. He realized this is a great blessing from Allah, that he didn't have to work. So he spent his entire life traveling around the Muslim world, spending that money, not for the pleasures of this world, but for the pleasures of the hereafter. And because of this, to this day, over a thousand and two hundred years after his death, his book is a standard book of reference. No student of knowledge or scholar can afford to be without it. And imagine, had he, sent his, had he spent his money on the pleasures and pursuits of this world, even had they been halal, he would have been an unknown person. Had he taken his money and bought the fanciest of mansions and houses and cars and ships and everything, whatever was in his time, he would have been an unknown person and no one would have ever heard his name. But because he was a wise person and he spent it on that which is beneficial, to this day, Imam al-Nisa'i is one of the greatest scholars of Islam and his book is one of the top six books of hadith. He has here a very interesting narration where he said that Jabir narrated that the Prophet ﷺ forbade building anything over the grave or building any type of structure around it or putting bricks over it or writing on top of it. It's right here. If you go to any Muslim graveyard in the, in the world today, unfortunately, or hardly, or every single Muslim graveyard except for a few, you will find huge monuments, large structures. Almost everyone will have writing on it. And here we have, directly from the books, the Prophet ﷺ telling us, do not build over graves. Do not put walls or structures around it. Don't even write. It's all a stepping stone. Once a person is dead, his actions are for, for Allah. He will not be able to benefit you or harm you. He is gone from this world and Allah will take care of him. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will account and judge him. But as for us, he has left us. He can neither harm us nor benefit us. Therefore, the scholars have agreed that it is not allowed to pray, to say salah in the graveyard. Even though you're praying to Allah. Because people might think that you're praying to the graves. It is haram, prohibited to pray to Allah in the grave. In the graveyard. Much less praying to the grave. We're talking about saying your salah. Suppose it's Dhuhr time, okay? And you happen to be in an area which is a graveyard. You're not allowed to pray. You have to get out. Even though you're praying to Allah. Because people might think that you are praying to the grave. Likewise, if there is a masjid on top of a grave, and unfortunately this too is very common, the scholars have unanimously agreed that it is completely prohibited to pray in such a masjid. Because that masjid now contains an icon of shirk. The person might have been pious, yes. But now people are worshipping it. People are directing their fear and love towards it. And even if that generation is not, then we know that later generations will. We know this from the story of Nuh. The story of Nuh, they put the graves, they put the icons in their masjid. That generation did not do anything. Future generations, they started exalting their status. So the scholars have agreed that it is not allowed to pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in a masjid which has a grave. If you're going and you need to pray and you find a masjid and you see there's a grave in it, leave it, leave it, pray somewhere else. Go to another masjid, or if you don't find another masjid, another masjid, pray in the street. You cannot pray in such a masjid. And in fact, if you have authority and control, if you're in a position of power in your country, and you have legitimate authority, then you must destroy either the masjid or the grave, depending on which one was first. If there was first the grave, and the masjid was built on top, then the masjid needs to be destroyed. And if there was a masjid, and then the person was buried inside, then the grave needs to be taken out and put in 
a different place. Not only is it prohibited to build over graves, to put monuments around it, to write over it, it is even prohibited to travel anywhere with the intention of visiting a grave. There is a beautiful hadith in Sahih Bukhari, uh, volume 3, if you can hand it to me, Akhi. Sahih Bukhari, volume 3. There is a beautiful hadith which clearly outlines, which clearly tells us when we can travel and when we cannot travel for religious reasons. What are the places in the world where we're allowed to travel? And this is in Sahih Bukhari, the most authentic book after the Qur'an. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Do not travel except to three mosques. The Masjid of Haram in Mecca, the Masjid of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in Medina, and the Masjid Al-Aqsa. Do not travel except to these three places. Now obviously everyone will say, what do you mean don't travel? I want to travel to visit my friend. I want to travel to visit my mother. I want to travel for business, for pleasure. Am I not allowed to travel? No, the meaning of this hadith is there are three religious sites and monuments which you're allowed to travel to see. Any other travel should not be for a religious reason, for a religious site. There are three holy places on the face of this earth. That's it. Masjid al-Haram in Mecca, the Masjid of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam in Medina, and the Masjid al-Aqsa in Jerusalem. These are the three holy lands, the holy places, the holy masjids. If you want to travel anywhere else, it must be for a worldly reason or a religious reason not related to a site. I want to study, I'm going to a different country to study. Here you are traveling for a religious reason intended for study. But you're not traveling because you think that that place is holy. I want to travel because I want to trade. I want to do this and that. Fine. But you say, I want to travel because I want to pray in that place. No. I want to travel because I want to seek the blessings of that place. No. Here it is clearly explicitly prohibited as in the hadith in Bukhari and other hadith it is not allowed to undertake a religious journey a journey where you're going to visit a supposed holy site except for the three masjids any other site on the face of this earth does not merit you to travel to it you are not allowed to why am I saying this here now because what occurs is that many Muslims undertake journeys to visit mausoleums they, they undertake journeys from one country to another, from one city to another, to go visit a grave. And this is a stepping stone to shirk. We conclude our talk for today by stating that of the stepping stones to shirk is the veneration of graves and the building of mausoleums. And because of this, the Prophet ﷺ has freed himself of these acts and he has prohibited the Muslims from traveling to visit these places, from building structures over them, from even writing anything over them, and from even praying in the locality and vicinity of graves, because the stepping stone to shirk and the basis for the first act of shirk was the veneration and the exaltation of the graves of pious people. We hope to see you next time. Until then, wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Oh.